As I'm sure you're aware, there are dozens of different types of antibiotics. So what we're going to look at today are some of the major classes of antibiotics, what type of bacteria they affect, meaning do they affect predominantly gram-positive bacteria or gram-negative bacteria, an example of some of these antibiotics that fit within each of these particular classes, and also their mechanism of action. So how are these particular antibiotics either bactericidal or bacteriostatic? Meaning how do they affect the bacteria to stop it from either dividing and growing anymore or just killing them right off? So, there is a mnemonic that I like to use which helps break down these particular classes. And the mnemonic is this. Antibiotics can protect the Queen's men, servants, and guards. So, antibiotics can protect the Queen's men, servants, and guards. Okay, so let's start at the very first one, A. So the first class of antibiotics that we're going to look at is the aminoglycosides. Now the aminoglycosides tend to predominantly affect gram-negative bacteria. And an example of this type of bacteria <clears throat> is streptomycin. Now the way that these aminoglycosides function, particularly streptomycin, is that they inhibit protein synthesis. So the mechanism of action here, I'm going to write protein synthesis. And if you think back or go back and look at one of the older videos that I presented that uh, show the differences between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Remember prokaryotic cells are bacteria, eukaryotic cells include our cells. So if you go back and have a look at some of those major differences, you'll see that the way that bacterial cells create their proteins are through ribosomes, same as us, but the ribosomal subunits are different. So for bacteria, the ribosomal subunits that translate this DNA code into protein are 50S and 30S, which together make a 70S ribosome. So 50S and 30S. Aminoglycosides specifically inhibit the 30S ribosomal subunit. <clears throat> and this is the aminoglycosides. If we go on to the next one, have a look at the one that starts with C. This is going to be cephalosporins. Now the cephalosporins can affect both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And an example of the cephalosporins is cephalothin. Now, the mechanism of action of the cephalosporins is that they actually inhibit cell wall synthesis. Now remember, eukaryotic cells or our cells specifically, don't actually have cell walls. Bacterial cells do, and that cell wall is made up of layers of peptidoglycan. And these peptidoglycan layers, you can think of being stacked on top of each other and need to be connected to one another. So if you go back and have a look at one of the older videos that show bacterial cells and their cell wall, you'll see that these peptidoglycan layers have peptides that hang off. And these, pepti uh, these peptides need to be cross-linked to one another, and that's how these layers stay stuck together. Now, the cephalosporins, their mechanism of action is that they stop the creation of those cross-links, meaning the peptides that are hanging off one glycoprotein and another can't get linked together, and they peel off, basically. Now, the importance of this is because inside a bacterial cell is very hyperosmotic, okay? So I should just say it's hyperosmotic. And what that means is water really wants to rush into that cell. And when water rushes into a cell, it's going to get big, fat and round and without any structural integrity will burst. And that's what the cell wall does. The glycoprotein stops bacterial cell walls from bursting. 
But once you've given the antibiotic cephalosporin or the antibiotic right. class of cephalosporins, and you stop this cell wall from being synthesized, and the cell gets big, fat, round, and bursts. So the next class of antibiotics that we'll look at, start with P, and this is probably one of the most common types that you've heard about, penicillins. Now penicillins predominantly are gram positive in their effect, and there's a number of different types of penicillin. So if we start off with the prototypical penicillin, penicillin G, you'll find that this is actually quite a large molecule, it's quite a large antibiotic, and that's why it's specifically affected the gram-positive bacteria. The reason why is, remember, gram-negative bacteria actually have two membranes. Gram-positive bacteria only have one membrane, gram-negative two, and that means it's more difficult for molecules to get through. So molecules can get through in these gram-negative, they have porins, so little channels for things to move through. However, Penicillin G is too large to move through these porins, hence it only affects the gram positive. Its mechanism of action, again, is cell wall synthesis. Now, in order for the penicillins to be able to affect some gram negative bacteria or become more broad spectrum, they created some semi synthetic penicillins, and this includes ampicillin. Ampicillin was able to affect gram-negative bacteria because it's semi-synthetic and it's smaller. It was able to fit through these porins. However, one of the downsides with penicillins is that bacteria can easily become resistant to them. And this is why. The basic structure of penicillin <clears throat> looks like that. Now, this square here, this little square subunit, is known as beta-lactam. And beta-lactam <clears throat> is extremely important. What it does is, when it comes into the cell, it actually binds up with the enzyme, <clears throat> binds up with the enzyme that connects those peptides together, that cross-links those peptides to hold the glycoprotein layers together. And that's what beta-lactam does, it hold, locks it away. But bacteria are very smart and very tricky, and they've been able, they've been able to create a resistance to beta-lactam and they create an enzyme called beta-lactamase. And beta-lactamase inactivates beta-lactam, stops it from working. In addition to that, some bacteria have created something known as penicillinase. Penicillinase breaks this link between the beta-lactam molecule and the rest of the penicillin molecule. So a lot of bacteria can develop a resistance to penicillin, such as penicillin, G, ampicillin. So again, to get around this, what scientists have been able to do is create another type of penicillin called methicillin. Now, methicillin has been extremely effective in the past because it is basically immune in a way to the beta-lactamase and the penicillinase, and they seem to have no effect on the methicillin. However, you may have heard of something called MRSA, that's methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Now, in that time, we have resistant. So there are now bacteria that have become resistant even to the methicillin. So again, this just highlights how easy it is for bacteria to become resistant to certain antibiotics. All right, let's move on to T. T are the tetracyclines. Now, the tetracyclines can affect both gram-positive and gram-negative. An example of a tetracycline is tetracycline itself. And the mechanism of action for tetracycline, again, it inhibits protein synthesis. And what subunit does it specifically affect? Again, the 30S subunit. Let's move on to the... Q. Now Q is quinolones and fluoroquinolones. And the quinolones and fluoroquinolones affect again both gram positive 
gram-negative bacteria. And one of the examples of antibiotics is cyprofloxacin. Now, what's the mechanism of action of quinolones and fluoroquinolones? All we've spoken about so far is inhibition of protein synthesis and inhibition of cell wall synthesis. This one's different. This is inhibition of DNA replication. When you look at DNA replication, you're going to have this double-stranded molecule, and it needs to unwind and open up so it can be read and transcribed. Now, when this unwinding happens, think about when you get a rubber band and you twist it around and then you pull two ends open. It starts to tighten up or tangle towards the end, right? So an enzyme that's required to untangle this wrapped DNA is called topoisomerase. And that's what the quinolones and fluoroquinolones specifically affect is the topoisomerases that are specific to bacteria. such as typosomerase 2 and 4. Okay, let's have a look at the next one, M. These are the macrolides. Now the macrolides predominantly affect gram-positive bacteria, and an, an example is erythromycin. The mechanism of action, again, protein synthesis. It inhibits protein synthesis. But it's different to the tetracyclines and the amino glycosides because they're the 30S subunit. Macrolides inhibit the 50S ribosomal subunit. Let's move on to S. And S is the sulfonamides. Now, the sulfonamides can affect both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, and one of the antibiotics is sulfur methoxazole. Sulfur methoxazole is one of the antibiotics within the sulfonamides. Now, the sulfonamides, again, are even different to what we've got so far. Inhibition of protein synthesis, inhibition of cell wall synthesis, inhibition of DNA replication. Now the sulfonamides, they work by interrupting or inhibiting the synthesis of folate. So folate synthesis. Now folate is extremely important in the maintenance of basic health within us and also within bacteria. But the way that it works between us and bacteria is different. Bacteria can synthesize their own folate, we cannot. We actually take our folate from our diet. And that's important because we don't have the enzyme that is important in this folate synthesis. And that's what it affects. Sulfonamides specifically interrupt that enzyme that's important in folate synthesis. Now let's have a look at the last one. Starts with G. This is our glycoproteins. And the glycoproteins predominantly affect gram-positive bacteria. And an example is vancomycin. And the way that they work, very similar to the penicillins, inhibition of cell wall synthesis. Now obviously there are some other antibiotics that do not fit within these classes. One important one is gentamicin. Now gentamicin has a very similar effect to these aminoglycosides. So, very similar to streptomycin. So, gentamicin it has its effect by inhibiting cell uh, protein synthesis, specifically the 30S subunit. So, this is the basic overview of some of the major classes of antibiotics, what type of bacteria they affect, some examples of those antibiotics, and the mechanism of action. Uh, action. You can see that there are very similar mechanisms of action, such as inhibiting protein synthesis, inhibiting cell wall synthesis, inhibiting DNA replication, and inhibiting metabolism.